Matt Oyes is our next presenter, and he is an extraordinary scholar. He's at Radford in uh, Virginia. I've been there. Uh, he teaches courses on the history of warfare with an emphasis on the relationship between warfare and societal change. He's won a Distinguished Scholar Award in the College of Humanities and Behavioral Sciences, and he won the Radford University's College of Arts and Sciences Distinguished Teaching Award in 2005 and 2006. He has a terrific book uh, that's right in the heart of what we're doing. It's called In Command, Theodore Roosevelt and the American Military. Matt, uh, welcome. You're uh, talking to us from Western Virginia tonight. I'm very much so, and we have a very nice day here as well after the remnants of, what was it, Sarah passed through yesterday. Um, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. Of course, like everyone, I wish I could be out there with you all. Uh, in part because, you know, I'm a, I'm a son of the Dakotas, so I was hoping for a really good reason. You're to from get South Dakota the originally. Great South Dakota, where in South Dakota? Well, I grew up in the big city, Sioux Falls. Oh, um, wow, that's all my Minnesota uh, and relatives Iowa. never let me forget that. No, we don't even regard that as South Dakota. But, all right, so what led you to, to write this book about Theodore Roosevelt? Well, you know, it's it's been quite a journey with it. Um, in some ways... My first you know, introduction to Theodore Roosevelt came from where you are tonight uh, on a childhood trip out to the, to the Badlands, to Medora. It was like first introduced to this fellow. Um, it became more of a serious thing though, of course, when I was in graduate school and uh, you know, realized that Roosevelt's impact on the military has certainly been looked at, but no one really had put it all together. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, how, how is that? And it really just shows how, you know, for so many topics, you can just find something that's out there that's, that's literally gold. Um, He's waiting for a competent historian, and here you are. So, uh, so we're so glad you're here. If we could, Anthony, if we can switch back now just to have the, the, um, the presenter um, on our screen. Uh, so when we were thinking about this, Matt, we thought, all right, what are the categories? There are cabinet members, and then there are diplomats, and there's the tennis cabinet, his informal group of, of social advisors, there's family, there's the big game hunting community, there are explorers, um, there are uh, bureaucrats, et cetera, conservationists, and of course, one thing you really want to talk about is TR and the military. He did say at the end of his uh, presidency that uh, not a shot had been fired, that he had lived through this profound period of peace. And he also said something I find really interesting. He said, you know, that he could never be regarded as one of the truly great presidents because he hadn't had to carry this country through a fundamental challenge. Of course, his fifth cousin, Franklin, got two of them in the, in the 1930s and 40s. But that, and he, it's not that he wanted a war as, as president. He was glad he didn't have one. But he thought that it, it perhaps put him in the, in the second tier, that it kept him from ultimate greatness because he hadn't had the kind of what well, the kind of challenge that we have at, at the moment in the United States. So so take it from there. Lay the table on TR and the military. Okay, will do. Uh, oh, before I do, I just want to say thank you again for inviting me to do this and Sharon as well and all the good stuff that the people at Dickinson State have, have done to make this happen. And I want to echo, you know, during the discussion that uh, was going on between the talks, just how well you have done this. Um, You've made this warm and inviting, and even though we have to be so far apart, I mean, I've really felt connected here. So tip of the hat, I just hope I can do half as well with what we're having to do in the classroom as, as your esteemed president was talking about as well. Um, do I have control to share the screen? Because I have a PowerPoint I would like to, to put up while I, I give some remarks. Anthony, you have that. You do have control, Matt. You, okay. you should be able to do that. Excellent. All right, should be coming on now. Here we are. All right, very good. Well, I want to first start big, you know, kind of start with the, the top end of the funnel here and, and narrow things down. Um, so first, what I'd like to talk about is um, Roosevelt's strategic, oops, got a little click happy there. Roosevelt's strategic vision, or it's going to be around that strategic vision that his military circle is going to be formed. Now, uh, you often hear around campaign season, although we really haven't heard so much this year because, well, other issues are consuming us, 
you know, that one campaign or another, one candidate or another really doesn't have a coherent foreign policy. Now, whether someone agreed with Theodore Roosevelt or, or not, that was not a charge that could have been leveled at all at TR. He had about as complex and fully formed vision for the United States role in the world that, that I have ever seen. Uh, his vision encompassed diplomatic, military, economic, and, and, and cultural goals. Roosevelt wanted the United States, just give a little overview, uh, of course, with its growing economic might, to assume a place in the front rank of powers. And according to the standards of the day, that would include uh, gaining and maintaining overseas territories for economic, diplomatic, and, and military position. It would involve creating military bases to project power and protect sea lanes. Uh, it would involve connecting the oceans with the Panama Canal. Uh, it would involve reorganizing the army. It would involve building a great battleship navy. I mean, they're all of one piece. And of course, on the Navy side, uh, Roosevelt, after all, had been espousing sea power theory since the 1880s, even before Alfred Thayer Mahan had published his famous book on the topic in, in, in 1890. But with Roosevelt, and this is where you really get to the depth of his vision, um, it, it, this, this strategic vision stretched beyond the military and you know, diplomatic standing. He worried that unless the nation took on greater overseas responsibilities, it could lose its strength of character. Tierra fretted that in an increasingly urban uh, nation, the, the frontier virtues, as he called them, uh, you know, things like fortitude, courage, initiative, physical hardiness, you know, those kinds of things, uh, you know, those would fade. And, uh, and instead, Americans would become absorbed in luxurious living. In short, for him, the martial spirit might be lost, and if the nation might, in TR's view, it might become uh, soft and flabby and preyed upon by others, much like parts of Africa and Asia were in his day. So for him, this, this is about striving and inner strength more, more than anything else. Now, Roosevelt could not, of course, achieve this strategic vision alone. Uh, it's been one of our themes this, this past couple of days. And of course, to do so, he needed help and would draw upon a group of trusted advisors. Now, the way I conceive of this, and the way I'm organizing this tonight as well, is that there's a first circle when Roosevelt was fairly new to the presidency, and a later circle when he's an old hand at the office. Now, no matter the time or the, in, the inhabitants in this military circle, the people that he brought into this fold often mirrored the president himself. They were men, as he put it, of push and intelligence, uh, who could get a job done, uh, who have strong moral character. Uh, and also, it didn't hurt if they were convivial company. After all, they were both his counselors and his friends most often. All right, so, so with that as the concept, uh, let's, let's look at the early circle first. And I think going into that, there's something of an assumption about Roosevelt that, that when he took over as president, that he was already fully formed as a chief executive. And, and to be sure, you know, he had rich experiences to draw from despite his mere 42 years. You know, obviously from the New York State Assembly in the 1880s, governor of New York, you know, we all know the whole litany, vice presidency, the vice presidency and so forth. And also, of course, he's, he's a quick study but there's still no substitute for experience. And as president, he is assuming a new range of duties. His first circle, therefore, is gonna have officials both rich with experience who could help the new president manage the reins. Now, last night, um, Patty discussed uh, El Haru, um, but he bears, he bears mention again. Um, Every time I come at Roosevelt's presidency, he emerges as, as, as such a central figure. Uh, first as Secretary of War and then as Secretary of State. I mean, if anyone's indispensable, it, it's root. And in thinking about the two men's relationships uh, before last night, I mean, I was really struggling for a way to capture that relationship with TR. And I loved Patty's term of the older brother. I thought that just really nailed it in so many ways. And Maybe because also I have an older brother, I'm the little brother, and I got some sense of that dynamic, but not in the high level of these fellows. 
Although I would add one thing uh, in, in terms of capturing Root um, that would take in more uh, the, the whole of his term of public service. Um, and that is he becomes such an old hand in Washington that I think the term Wiseman, even though it's going to be used for a later generation, could have been applied to him as, you know, as it later would be applied to people like Avril Harriman or Paul Nitza, or Cyrus Vance, and so forth. He, he's, in, he's in that realm, really. Now, as New Yorkers, uh, TR and Root were already well acquainted uh, when Roosevelt became president. Uh, Root had known Theodore Sr. Uh, he had supported TR's first bid for the state assembly. I uh, had helped clear up um, a residency issue when TR ran for governor of New York. Uh, he was essentially TR's chief counselor. And, and when Root announced his desire to step down as Secretary of War, uh, TR lamented that, that no one can quite fill his place. Root's more conservative inclinations helped to temper TR's stronger impulses. And, and as Patty said, he, he could speak hard truths to TR certainly more than his successor at the War Department, William Howard Taft, was able to do. Um, Roosevelt said Taft was too much like him to give as good advice as Root. Well, actually, I misspoke there because actually Edith, who said that, and Roosevelt adopted her judgment. She's such a keen judge of character there. Um, Root was an intense worker. Um, he demanded excellence, and thereby he got things done. Uh, and when in work mode, he was completely focused and, and came off as cold and aloof at times. And even his wife thought, you know, thought that about him too. But of course, as was mentioned last night, um, Ruth's sense of humor bounced off his intensity. And like a big brother, he liked to tease TR. And you know, so often you see photos of like, like this of, of Ruth that I have up on screen there right now. But I think, uh, and I love this photo that someone colorized of Root later on with Kelvin Coolidge, uh, because it does capture that side of Root very well, I think. Uh, and of course, you know, I think as Patty mentioned too, there are endless examples of Root's humor that he often hand wrote in the margins of messages to the president. And, you know, that was one of the sheer delights of doing research in his papers at the, the Library of Congress, you know, sitting there in the manuscript reading room and, and, and getting these moments of levity that sometimes, you know, other researchers are looking at you. And it's like, well, what is this person laughing at? Um, you know, for example, um, just, just one here. Roosevelt was famous uh, for his really long annual messages to Congress. And, you know, the various secretaries had to review these things before they went out and they contributed their portions to them as well. And uh, Root once teased him, uh, you know, on into the presidency for once only, per only producing 63 pages. And he wrote back, your, your mental powers are failing. Uh, a really active president would have more than 63 pages. It's a perfect example of his digs. Now, of course, Root is inherited from McKinley, but as TR Secretary of War, uh, the able Root was trusted to take on the hard issues. And early in TR's presidency, he had to handle really two hot button issues with the, within the military. Uh, first, the drive to create an army general staff, uh, and then even more explosively, the charges of American atrocities in the Philippines. Yeah, in both, Root had to deal with the commanding general of the army, Nelson Appleton Miles, who had his own ideas, and by this time did not care much for Theodore Roosevelt. Miles had distinguished himself during the Civil War and was well known for his actions on the frontier after that conflict. Uh, he had gigantic political ambitions of his own uh, and viewed TR as an upstart who had gained fame for essentially two battles uh, in a short war, nothing to compare to the cauldron of the Civil War. Now, the, the general staff was the capstone of efforts to reorganize the army after the war with Spain. Uh, and Root, of course, had led the charge on that effort, and, and give it a body with drawing up war plans to avoid some of the issues, of course, that occurred with the mobilization during the War of Spain. Miles put all of his weight against it, as the proposal would have eliminated his position. Uh, he would testify before Congress that a general staff ran counter to American military tradition, uh, that it smacked too much of, of German militarism, or he used Prussian militarism too at times, uh, the bill failed, and, and to get a second attempt through, Root uh, revised the bill and, 
and adroitly maneuvered among various political constituencies. And he, he also sent miles far away from Washington on an inspection tour of the Philippines. The move with Miles may have helped to get the general staff bill through, but brought another complication when, when Miles, um, doing the honorable thing, but also determined to embarrass the administration at the same time, came back with charges of American atrocities in the Philippines as troops sought to subdue resistance against US rule. Uh, troops were accused of burning villages, uh, summer executions, tortures, uh, a, whole, a whole range of his horrific things. Now, T.R. and Root worried that such charges would undermine public support for American imperialism. Root shouldered the burden of crafting the administration defense. He's going to carry, he's really going to carry the water here. Hearings were held, uh, and some officers were court martialed, inquiries were launched. Uh, they publicly condemned torture, deeming it unacceptable, but they also publicly played down what had happened. Both T.R. and Root said that the treachery of the foe had provoked soldiers and that some of the torture methods were actually rather mild. Well, the water cure is, is not mild. Uh, the charges did tarnish Root's record. Uh, it's probably one big blemish on it. Um, but his efforts tamped down the controversy. Uh, he remained a Secretary of War despite calls for his resignation. Uh, and the American colonial presence in the Philippines, of course, remained. So, I mean, given his abilities uh, across a whole range of matters, but to handle such difficult things as this, uh, it's no wonder that TR wanted him back as Secretary of State after Root took a, a, a break from the cabinet for a time in 1904. All right, uh, let's, um, let's now turn to the Navy side. Of course, that's so close to TR's heart. And early in his presidency, Roosevelt's also going to have a trusted, experienced team that he could rely upon. Now, for the Navy, he did not need someone quite like Root because, of course, he'd been Assistant Secretary of the Navy, but he put in place two men who combined brought a uh, considerable skill set to the Navy Department. So as soon as he could, TR swapped his old boss from the Navy Department, John D. Long, for someone more like himself. And that someone more like himself is going to be this guy. Oops, I forgot to show you the slide on the war in the Philippines. That's what happens when the speaker runs it, runs it themselves. As you can see there, of course, the troops are fighting. Uh, some of the editorial cartoons regarding American atrocities. Uh, Root, of course, mounting his defense. But this is the guy I was talking about with the Navy. William Henry Moody. And, and Moody's going to commend himself in, in a number of ways to, to Roosevelt. Uh, he was a Harvard man. Uh, he had graduated the very year that uh, TR entered Harvard. Uh, he had studied history, so they both uh, you know, liked that discipline. Uh, he was quite active in his prime, embraced physical activities, a very good baseball player. Uh, in fact, at one point, he'd been president of the New England Baseball League. Uh, he was in his 40s, like Theodore Roosevelt, and when we came in, he was the youngest member of the cabinet. Uh, he's also known for his straightforward talk and exuberance, and it, both in terms of his manner and physique, it was said he bore a striking resemblance to TR. People thought they could have been members of, of the same family, in fact. Now, he's useful to TR in part because he's from Massachusetts, the same state Long had come from, so you keep a Massachusetts place in the cabinet. Um, but he has served several terms in the House of Representatives, um, having first risen to prominence in, the, in the, that Commonwealth by um, helping with the prosecution of the Lizzie Borden axe murder case. But in Congress, he served on the Appropriations Committee, and that's going to be in, instrumental for obtaining the goal that both men want a big Navy. Like TR, he's a strong, big Navy man. Standing beside Moody is this man, Rear Admiral Henry Clay Taylor, who became head of the Bureau of Navigation in 1902. And at the time, that's the most powerful uniform position in the Navy Department. Taylor's older, he's in his late 50s, but he had qualities that TR admired. He, he was an intellectual, 
He had been uh, head of the Naval War College, and he, he had a reputation as a man of action, the perfect combination for Roosevelt. Uh, in the 1880s, he had rescued the American missionaries from the Caroline Islands in the Pacific. Uh, during the war with Spain, uh, he'd ably handled the battleship Indiana, on which I believe he's pictured here in, in this image, uh, in the sea battle off Santiago de Cuba. It also didn't hurt with Roosevelt that his family line traced directly back to the Revolutionary, Revolutionary War leader, Daniel Morgan, the, the hero of the Battle of Cowpens in South Carolina. Together, this, this team of Moody and Taylor would help TR secure his, great, his greatest burst of, of naval building. Uh, seven battleships were, were authorized during the two years that they were in place. And they organized the first true maneuvers of the battle fleet off Puerto Rico in 1902 to put ideas about sea power into action. Moody and Taylor also sought to improve the ability of American gunners to hit their targets. And, and that's a real priority because they discovered after the war with Spain that our gunners had really trouble hitting much of anything. Uh, when, when they uh, studied the battle, um, they discovered, and I believe I got this about right, that the American forces had expended over 9,000 shells in the Battle of Santiago, off Santiago de Cuba. And on the Spanish hulks, uh, after the battle, they counted only 122 hits. Um, they also want to bring about a naval general staff like Root has brought to the army, uh, but that's one goal they're going to be unable to achieve. All in all, the, the Moody-Taylor tandem, it's a, it's a very able team, but it doesn't last long. It, it's gone by the summer of 1904, uh, in part because Roosevelt has other plans for Moody. Um, he moves him to attorney general, uh, take advantage of, uh, taking advantage of his legal background, uh, and then soon moved him to the Supreme Court. For Taylor, uh, his time in the circle ends tragically. Uh, he's visiting his son in July 1904 when an affliction, um, likely peritonitis, claimed him very suddenly. Well, the change that occurred in the Navy Department after Moody and Taylor's departures illustrates well the nature of TR's military circle later in his presidency. By 1904, TR had put his own stamp on the presidency and didn't need to rely as much on experienced hands as in the past. And from this point on, TR is certainly going to be more of his own Secretary of the Navy. Um, and it's just going to be a revolving door at the Navy Department at this point. Thus, Brought into close into the naval circle are, are going to be two younger officers, well, relatively speaking. William S. Sims and Albert L. Key are approximately the same age as, as Theodore Roosevelt, and, and much like Roosevelt, they have a reputation for being mavericks, uh, being brash, um, and they really want to see the Navy Department reorganized with its own general staff. They don't want to see that fight die. Uh, and they're certainly going to prove to be men of push and intelligence, like, of course, TR values. Both are going to have TR's ear because they're going to be presidential naval aides during the latter part of TR's presidency. And, and TR welcomed their critical insights into the operation of, of the naval bureaucracy. I mean, Sims had already ingratiated himself uh, by leading the charge to improve uh, the Navy's gunnery. And, and with their ad advice, I mean, TR is hoping that he can use their insights to push conservative Navy bureauc bureauc bureaucracy uh, when it needs to be pushed to, to speed the production of, of needed equipment as part of his modernization efforts. This younger team was perhaps more than the president bargained for. They were determined and, and downright, well, irrepressible at times. Uh, they, they really wanted to see the Navy Department reorganized, and, and there were no strangers to generating controversy to achieve an end, well, kind of like TR would do from time to time. For example, uh, in 1907, 1908, uh, Sims and Key lay behind charges that there are major defects in American battleship designs. Uh, TR's prized naval possessions, and at a time when the fleet had just departed on the world cruise. 
they had hoped to generate publicity to show why the Navy Department needed reform at a time when, when all eyes were upon the fleet. Now, TR is not happy. Um, and he was trying at the time to get Congress to approve more battleships. And he knew opponents of building more ships would, would seize on this news. And you really see him, I guess, in this case, acting like the dad here. Um, he really, he takes charge of the situation. Um, he did recognize that there was some merit to Sims and Key's charges and defects. Uh, so he keeps them on. Um, he, he did threaten them with you know, charges of insubordination, but he shortens their leash. Um, and then he tries to tamp down negative publicity. Uh, he does get the Navy to improve ship designs. Um, and he thereby gave Congress confidence to approve more battleships, which it did. Uh, in some ways, it's a really masterful performance of TR. You know, you see him thinking strategically at so many different levels on how to, how to make things happen. And this is a case of him dealing with something that's, you know, proving explosive uh, towards one of his major policies. Um, and, and he really navigates himself through it very, very well. To balance Sims and Key, and you know, we always see this with TR now too, there's, there's always kind of a balance here, uh, whether it's like between him and Root, or in this case, um, within his new naval circle, between Sims and Key and another man, uh, he's gonna turn to another career officer who'd been a naval aide, but who has a special in with the president, that's William S. Cowles, his brother-in-law. Charles was married to TR's elder sister, Anna. Uh, and of course, Roosevelt famously consulted Anna on major decisions at her home in Washington, the so-called other White House, and would take advantage of Charles' advice as well. Uh, and by the way, when he'd visit the house too, he'd take advantage of the time to play with their young son, uh, Sheffield. He'd play bear with him on occasion as well. Charles was someone he could turn to who could tell him what was really going on in the Navy especially any intrigues among officers or personality quirks. And, and TR could ask personal questions and, and not have them leaked. Um, for example, at one time he, he asked about a particular admiral uh, and he asked using his word if the man was a, a lunatic for some off-base advice that he had given. And Cowles replied rather diplomatically that the officer in question was, was known more for his handling of ships than, than his intellect. Charles was not just good for such information. He was also older than Sims and Key and provided TR with uh, cooler, more conservative views to bounce off their reformer instincts. With Charles, however, there were times when the relationship grew complicated. Uh, TR was commander in chief, Charles a Navy officer, and TR needed to avoid the appearance of conflict of interest. He wanted to make sure that he could not be charged with favoring a family member and was put in the uncomfortable position of having to step back from time to time. Um, like, for example, one time Cowles is in command of the battleship Missouri. There's a collision with another ship, which can be deadly to a naval career. Um, TR has to step back and let the Naval Board of Inquiry do its work. Later, there was an explosion aboard the Missouri that killed several sailors. And TR steps back. And in this case, Cowles was commended for his actions in saving the ship. Well, time's a ticking. So I, I want to get to the final figure here. Uh, and we, we, we can't leave looking at Roosevelt's military world and, and not mention Leonard Wood. Uh, we consider him last tonight because he occupied a unique place in the military circle. If TR maintained a degree of circumspec circumspection for a family member or like Cowles, he made little attempt to hide his favoritism for Wood, who was almost a member of the family. Uh, you know, the Wood, Re Wood Roosevelt relationship was special. I mean, it, it made both men's careers. Wood had been the first commander of the Rough Riders, and the experience in the War of Spain uh, allowed him to rocket up the Army ranks. I, he jumped from the permanent rank of captain to brigadier general in almost one fell swoop. And, and Tier and Wood were linked in so many ways. Uh, they both embraced strenuous activity, they wanted to advance the new American empire. They believed in active citizenship and the benefits of military training on character. But they also just enjoy, enjoyed each other's company and were playmates, as, as TR put it. Uh, in 1890s Washington, they could be seen uh, as part of a group that enjoyed kicking a football around a, a, a spare lot in their free time. 
Uh, T.R. talked about solemnly kicking this football around. Uh, and then during the White House years, they enjoyed this uh, practice of kind of bow sword fighting, really, uh, known as single stick. And they, they put on padded clothing. And this illustration really doesn't do justice. T.R. TR describes putting on many more pads than this. Uh, and then they just proceed to whack away at each other. Um, and T.R. recounts, of course, the many injuries he sustained doing this, too. Roosevelt's going to consult Wood on army matters, especially regarding the new interest, with Wood being governor general of Cuba early on, and later then when he was posted to the Philippines. But TR held Wood in high regard for more profound reasons than his companionship and military opinions. He put him on a pedestal as the model American at the turn of the 20th century, um, and, and he really esteems him. Uh, he esteems his feats of physical endurance, and his character. I mean, to, to him, Wood was a man of, well, that's how you put it, high of heart and clean of life, who had boundless energy and was by nature a soldier of the highest type. Tierra wanted others to embrace this ideal and had no compunctions about pushing Ritz, Wood's career ahead despite charges of presidential favoritism. Uh, there could, though, be a price to being Tierra's friend. And their close association would prevent Wood from a top command when the U.S. entered World War I. Wood's connection to TR was poison to Roosevelt's political nemesis, Woodrow Wilson. And if that were not enough, prior to entry into World War I, Roosevelt showed up at the Plattsburgh training camp in 1915, run by Wood to endorse the general's efforts to train public-spirited business people and professionals in case of war. Unfortunately for Wood, TR took the opportunity to disparage Wilson's leadership. And if there had still been any chance, however slim it might have been, of Wood leading the army during the war, TR's words thank his chances. All in all, whether it was Wood or others, TR's military advisors were capable and astute, and who along with their boss joined to make a force more capable of handling the coming challenges of the 20th century. Sometimes they had their own priorities, but they were also companions in whom TR could place a good deal of trust and responsibility. American military capabilities later in the century owed much to their work at the start of the century. Well, at this point, uh, I fear I've gone on too long, so I really want to turn things back over to you, Clay, so we can maybe dig in on a few of these things and get a conversation going. Well, first of all, thank you for setting the table. It's terrific. Um, I have a bunch of questions, and I know the audience, um, our participants around the country do too. So again, chat in your um, your questions, and um, our staff member Kelly will be um, uh, sending them on to me. Let me start with this. Um, first, an easy one. Why did Root win the Nobel Peace Prize? Well, you know, Root is a fellow who is interested in avoiding war. Um, and so he's going to lead efforts for international arbitration, uh, for peaceful ways of achieving comedy uh, among nations. Um, and, you know, he's certainly going to distinguish himself uh, with that, particularly after he leaves uh, his position in the cabinet when Roosevelt's presidency ends. So, again, for arbitration. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's a fellow who, you know, embraces that, that particular movement. Um, and, you know, Roosevelt, is, if I recall right, he's actually, you know, the nominal president of an arbitration league, although he says, you know, we don't want to let that be a substitute for being prepared. He still says, the, you know, the best guarantee of peace is, of course, a ready Navy and a trained army. So uh, Sharon asked a question. It's a really good one. You talked about... Uh these niches that haven't been filled for biographers and historians, and you filled one so admirably with your book, there isn't really a good biography of Root. Uh, what do you recommend? Uh, there isn't. Um, and in fact, I, I've actually contemplating doing that. Um, you know, the, probably the, the one biography is that's of kind of much much good. They're, they're really rather dated. Um, 54, I think, was the last one. That's a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, every generation brings us new insights. Um, just to give you a preview, um, I mean, I have toyed with that idea, but 
Um, right now, when I'm working on something, and this is why this, this fit in so perfectly for me because um, it's right along the lines that I'm thinking. Uh, I've been working on um, research on Roosevelt's lieutenants, kind of a, um, a tentative title here. I'm not sure that's where it would end up. And uh, you know, looking at the dynamics between Roosevelt and these individuals, but really to give them more credit here. Uh, I mean, we rightly put TR at the center of the universe here, but I think we need to look at these individuals and study more of the dynamics between them. Um, and, and that's what I've been working on right now as, as basically a follow-on. Uh, and, you know, individuals who don't get the same kind of look. Um, Moody, uh, he could be the subject of a biography himself. A fascinating person. Uh, I think Root needs more attention again. Henry Clay Taylor uh, is something that I'm surprised some graduate student somewhere <laughs> hasn't picked up on some mentor, you know, pulling open their desk drawer and saying, hey, take a look at this. Yeah, so I, again, you're right. There's just so many things to chew over. Uh, Patricia O'Toole, our keynote, gives you the highest compliment. She said you would write a fantastic biography of Elihu Root, so um, get on it. <laughs> Well, I, pre I appreciate that, that that pat on the back and that push at the same time. Well, you just have to spend five years doing it. You know? yeah. Fun. But, you know, he's such a colorful figure. He's such a sarcast. Uh, he's famous for the way the, the, the ironic jabs he gives to Roosevelt. He's, he would be fun. He's not some dry character that you have to plow through. You know he's going to pay off a biographer at every turn. Well, you know, and he has these contradictions within himself, this corporate lawyer who supports reform, uh, fellow secretary of war, who's also the head of, you know, uh, pushing arbitration movements and so forth. Um, a power politician who, you know, uh, becomes too lawyerly at times, but also has this moral stripe with him. He's an interesting character. Uh, and so, yeah, he hasn't been looked at it. You mentioned Admiral Dewey in your talk. Give us a, a sense of that. Um, with Dewey, in terms of Roosevelt's circle, uh, Dewey's a useful person for Roosevelt while he's president. You know, after all, as we said, Roosevelt's his own secretary of the Navy. Uh, and, and, you know, basically Dewey is all but retired. He's, he's the head of the general board of the Navy, which gives advice to the secretary of the Navy. Not nowhere near a general staff. Um, and... He, it was said that he often began to sleep through those meetings. So as Admiral of the Navy, he's certainly someone that Roosevelt can summon up. Uh, they do bring him back for active duty during those maneuvers um, uh, off uh, Puerto Rico to take place in 1902 as part of those first fleet maneuvers. And of course that very much came in handy having someone of his stature, you know, the Admiral of the Navy, when the crisis over Venezuela erupted with, with, with Germany. Um, but, you don't see Roosevelt consulting him that much. Um, he's seen as too conservative, um, someone who's not really going to be pushing reform much within the Navy Department. Uh, and I might add too, the same with Mahan. By this point, you know, Roosevelt finds him as someone somewhat useful to refer to, uh, but he's like, I know almost sea power better than you. You know, <laughs> you, you just got all the publicity here, so we're going to use that. So there's more distance between them during his presidency. But uh, of course, Dewey plays a, a key role in the romance of Roosevelt in Cuba. He, uh, as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, he sent the famous telegraph, telegram to Dewey about uh, bottling up the Spanish fleet in, in Manila Bay. Right. And yeah, I mean, er earlier, Roosevelt had, had fought for Dewey to be head of that squadron, sensing there could be trouble com coming of Spain. Uh, I think it was one former Secretary of the Navy who was a senator. I can't remember. I think it was Redfield Proctor of Vermont. Um, had really been uh, lobbying for this uh, fellow named John Adams Howell, but Roosevelt's like, no, no, he doesn't have the fighting temperament. And um, Dewey had really impressed him um, during a crisis with Chile or, uh, earlier in the 1890s when some American sailors had gotten into trouble in Valparaiso and uh, Dewey had, uh, you know, cold up his ship without orders, ready to go at a moment's notice. And that's the kind of guy TR wanted. So yeah, in the 1890s, yeah, he's, he's a fighter, and that's what TR wants. Thank you very much. Um, here's a question from Rick Marshall, our cartoon expert. Can you tell us more about Plattsburgh, for those who might not know about it? Was it a government program, a private program? What was its role in the, in the build-up to the war? 
Yeah, Plattsburgh, and, and that has been subject to several studies because um, it's this kind of interesting private-public partnership as a way to describe it. Um, Wood is someone who, when he was Army Chief of Staff, you know, he's there under Taft and then the early part of the Wilson administration. Um, Wood is very interested in building up an Army Reserve. You know, the peacetime establishment of the United States is very small uh, following historical tradition. Um, and he wants an expandable force and he just is not able to get a reserve built up. So after his time as, as Army Chief of Staff, he becomes uh, the commander of the Department of the East is how he you know, divided the country. He, he, had, he had that big division or Department of the East. Uh, and in the summer times, he would hold these, these encampments where um, you would have uh, these business people or professionals pay for the privilege of being subjected essentially to basic training. Um, and they did this, they did a little bit in 1914, uh, and then in 1915, they expanded it. 1916, uh, they expanded it even more. And it's, of course, not at Plattsburgh. Uh, the idea is called that, but it's, you know, there's a sprinkling of these camps across the country by then. And then, of course, by 1917, well, the United States has entered the war, so those camps end. But they do become ultimately the basis for ROTC programs across the country. Thank you. Um, I want to do a shout out to Jeremy Johnston from Cody, uh, Wyoming, a dear friend of ours. We, he's hosted us. And by the way, Jeremy, we still want that saddle, but let that go for the moment. Uh, Jeremy's question for you, Matt, is how would you characterize TR's relationship with F.E. Warren, who played a key role in the Senate regarding military affairs? Um, it's a good relationship. That's a great question. Um, Warren is going to be someone who's instrumental in pushing forward something TR really wants to do. It's always been close to his heart as, as a civil service reformer. Um, promotion by merit, right? For him, character is most important, whether it's in civilian government jobs or, or, or in military positions. And um, he never gets promotion by merit pushed through. It's still done strictly uh, by, by seniority up, up to uh, the ranks of, of colonel. Um, but Warren is someone who supports that in part because, well, his son-in-law is, is John J. Pershing. Uh, and Roosevelt, is, of course, attends their wedding. It's a, one of the big events in Washington. And Pershing is going to be one of those fellows who Roosevelt will elevate from the permanent rank of captain. You know, they had all these temporary ranks at the time, but his permanent rank was captain. And of course, Roosevelt can move him up to Brigadier General. Um, and Warren will certainly help make sure that one is delivered. But there's others subsequent to that. Um, and th this has gotten controversial. Even, the, even though Wood was moved up in his turn as Major General from Brigadier in 1903, 19, I guess it was 93. Um, now everyone's looking for favoritism, favoritism. The Pershing nomination you know, brings that about. Um, but then it's really hard to push them through after that. And Warren is instrumental for keeping you know, some progress going there. So you know, if you can't get a promotion by merit system, this is the next best thing that TR is turning to. Thank you. Back to Mary Kay Stronach, who asks, can you elaborate on Leonard Wood's role in the Philippines? Um, yeah, Wood is going to be uh, sent out there uh, to take up the post basically as the governor of Mindanao. And there is where, you know, even though they officially declare the you know, Philippine resistance against American rule uh, to be ended by what, July 4th, 1902, uh, as we know, these things don't wrap up quickly. It is not to... Um, quote someone else, mission accomplished. Um, and uh, particularly with the Moro people, you know, an Islamic people in Mindanao, that struggle keeps going. Um, and Wood is going to use pacification tactics. Um, he's going to use, apply some of his experiences that are, he also used governing uh, as governor general of Cuba. And there's going to be controversy because um, there's a major massacre that occurs with it. Um, I'm going to get this name wrong now, the Bujalo uh, volcano. 
And um, for Wood's career, it's fortunate that the Philippines is far away and uh, that uh, press coverage, especially in Mindanao, uh, was not then what it is now. Um, and uh, it's another case where, again, the charges of American atrocities, which they thought they had tamped down, have risen back up again. And so atrocity is a subject I just want to hone in on here for a moment. You know, during the, the recent Gulf Wars and the, the war on terrorism, waterboarding became a significant and controversial tactic by some members of our CIA and, and the military forces. Um, and um, often it was said that waterboarding has a long pedigree, but that it was uh, first used in American history during the war in the Philippines. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, um, it's called the water cure. And it's used primarily to get intelligence out of individuals, you know, because if you're fighting insurgents, uh, they're melted into the local countryside, the local population, and you're trying to find ways to, to identify them. Uh, so it frequently involves civilians who are believed to have supported uh, or, or are supporting insurgents. It was actually a tactic used in the Philippines before the Americans arrived uh, and the Americans adopted. Um, and um, I don't wanna be upset anyone too much here, but it's, it's more severe than waterboarding. Uh, in this case, you would, you would lay the person down and you know, there are cases where they were doing this to children um, and they would insert a hose down their throat with a funnel and then fill their bellies full of water till they're incredibly distended, which alone is painful. And then sometimes they would punch or kick them. Um, now, the idea was that they didn't want to kill them. Well, sometimes that did happen. You would cause ruptures. Uh, but the idea was that th this way we can get intelligence out of these individuals. Uh, and it, it is one of the things when Miles brings forth these charges that is most going to appall the American people. So, you know, uh, we, there are a couple more questions I want to get to, and then we're sort of about to run out of time, too. But let me ask this, you know, it was during this time that Mark Twain wrote uh, one of his most extraordinary essays to the person sitting in darkness, and he became a very severe critic of American activity as an imperial nation, but particularly with respect to the Philippines. And um, you know, Roosevelt became very uptight about that, and they were sort of friends and not friends. But... Um, you know, most people think of Twain as this sort of genial um, quipster, but he, there was a very strong anti-imperial movement in this country, and one of the leading figures of it was Samuel Clemens. Yeah, I mean, and sometimes I think that whole anti-imperial movement, not just Clemens, needs more attention. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you have Senator George Hoare of what, um, Massachusetts, uh, Carl Schurz, um, you know, the Civil War figure. Uh, who's really its moral consciousness. Uh, but, you know, Clemens adds in that, 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 that edge, right, that he can. And so often that's what's most effective. I mean, because it, you see with individuals who are, who are gifted in, 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 in the literary arts and uh, at satire, that they can get at the nub of things that, that others just can't do. Um, but I think overall, that's another area that really could use more work. Uh, it, it doesn't so for get those who are interested in uh, Mark Twain to the person sitting in darkness, I'm sure it's available online. Uh, President Easton asks this question. Uh, TR famously ended up being disappointed in William Howard Taft and then Oliver Wendell Holmes. In military circles, whom did he wind up being disappointed in? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, In military circles, let me think on that a little bit. Certainly Miles, of course. Yeah, Miles, um, but Miles is someone he can write off as this brave peacock, right? As this man of this previous generation. Um, but, you know, during his presidency and, and thereafter, um, You know, I might come back to, to Mahan in some ways. Because really? He, he, yeah, he just kind of considers him an irritant. 
by the time he's president, uh, especially when Mahan comes out at the very time they're switching the type of battleship from the kind that would sail in the, you know, the, the Great White Fleet, this kind of mixed caliber type to the, you know, the ones we're familiar with from World War II, the dreadnought style, right? Kind of the all big gun battleship. And Mahan, you know, weighs in and says, no, no, he's, he's still stu he's stuck in the past. We need to have a, a new settled type, like the ship of the line was the 74 gunner back in the great age of sail. And that's the last thing Roosevelt wants out there. And he realizes this guy is just severely out of touch. And he really distances himself from them. Uh, only you know, citing him after that when he needs to cite sea power, but or when he needs him as a uh, like a member of a board or something like that to attract some you know name power to it. But yeah, he he and he starts lecturing Mahan as well about how he got this wrong, and it's, it's kind of interesting where you go from you know where he's patting Mahan on the back in the 1890s, right? You know, you go you know get the word out there to like basically. Um, rein it in because you're just wrong, um, and it's 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 kind of where the pupil has now become become the professor. Um, let me ask a couple of, of kind of easy questions, and Sharon, I think we're close, right? Okay. So here's a question that's kind of fun. I hope you have I have the, uh, an answer to it. Uh, Tr was very much on the strenuous life for the military, and he wanted them to do a 50 mile march. And then there was the question of a hundred mile horseback ride, and there was a lot of pushback, like oh, who is this guy telling us uh, what uh, strenuous life is? And so then Tr did the horseback ride, and and it's kind of a it's kind of a fascinating story. Yeah, it is. Um, there was pushback um, because um, the the Navy had the, the Navy officers because he's trying to raise physical fitness standards, as you said, uh, they had to walk 50 miles in three days. Uh, and then army officers had to do a, a forced march over 90 miles in three days. Uh, and that involved, uh, you know, being on a mount, but also then leaving the mount at a trot. And yeah, there's a lot of pushback, especially from the naval officers. Yeah, after all, they're on ships, right? What, what, what do we need this for? Um, and, uh, you know, the first time they did it, uh, there's there's a run on shoes in Washington from all these staff officers in the Navy Department. Um, guys are complaining about blisters and losing toenails and so forth. Um, and, you know, Roosevelt's worried late in his presidency that this is going to go away, right? Because it's just based on an executive order and the pressure is building. And um, he thinks Taft will probably keep it in place, but he's not certain. And he just, you know, I think it's the last hurrah, because this is in January, 1909. He's like, well, I'm gonna do it, and I'm gonna do it in one day. <laughs> and so, now, they did arrange teams of horses so that you didn't exhaust the poor animals, but uh, yeah, they leave White House before dawn, you know, it's the early hours of the morning. It's, it's a small team. It's, you know, the um, personal physician of the president, his military aide, Archie Butt, uh, and I think one other person besides Roosevelt, and they ride to Warrington, Virginia about 45 miles away. Uh, they get there around noontime, so they have lunch, and then, of course, TR starts politicking as well. Um, and then uh, they have to return, uh, and uh, there is a blizzard that hits them on the way back. it had been a beautiful day on the way out, but you all know up there in North Dakota <laughs> how these things can come rushing in. Uh, and so they come back in this tremendous storm, and, uh, you know, they get back to the White House about eight or nine of, clock, uh, of the clock, and, um, uh, Roosevelt gets off the horse and repeatedly says, it was like taking candy from a baby. Um, <laughs> Has a little hot tea, warms himself up. Yeah, yeah, probably reads a book or two, right? <laughs> Goes to bed. It's a great story, but, you know, he had the right stuff. Whatever else you say about TR, he had the right stuff. And then when John Kennedy became president, he found TR's letter about the 50-mile hikes. He instituted it, it became a national craze. And his brother Robert Kennedy walked 50 miles in a single day in loafers from the White House to Camp David, and it became a huge Life magazine thing. And there were 50-mile hikes all over this country based on Kennedy's discovery of a TR document about the 50-mile hike. I, w I wish we could do one with you tomorrow around Medora. We would do it. You know, I've done it. I, we did it. I, I, when I found out about this, we did it in, um, uh, about eight years ago. And we, we were four of us and, th and three of us finished. And we buried the fourth somewhere at mile 22. So last question. It's a big one. And I know we don't have time for it. But 
So TR wins the Nobel Peace Prize, his first president to do so. You talked at the beginning, your first remarks were about his strategic comprehensive capacity to see the world's dynamics. And here's a really interesting case of it. Not only does he boldly call for America to play a role in arbitrating this conflict at a time when most of the world thought the United States was not nearly ready for such boldness, but he also um, kind of bullied uh, the two sides into working it out. I mean, he understood and he said that if, 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 if the war went on, not only would it really alter the balance of power in a dangerous way, but it probably would bring about the moment when the United States would have a reckoning with Japan. And so, I mean, you're seeing here an extraordinary geopolitical thinker, right? A absolutely. I don't know that I can add much to that, Clay, because, I mean, he is thinking at different levels here, um, you know, in terms of achieving a balance in Northeast Asia. Uh, that is going to best fit American interests um, and uh, you know, avoid that reckoning with Japan that he does he does see coming, even though Japan, of course, has been a, somewhat of a protege of the United States un until that point in time. Um, he, um, you know, has to think also at the level of what is it going to take, you know, to achieve the settlement here? What are the chips I have available to me here? You know, and the setting as well is inspired. It, re it reminds me so much of you know, uh, later on what Richard Holbrook would do with the Dayton Accords, uh, and uh, you know, putting him in an isolated place at, at Wright Pass, Air, Wright Pat Air Force Base, uh, getting him to focus their minds. Of course, you know, Washington at that time of the year wasn't a good place to be anywhere, anyways, at that time without air conditioning. Um, but yeah, I mean, it really is impressive the levels that he thinks at and the different moving pieces that he has working at all times. And in the Al Jazeera incident, he said that he postponed the Great War by maybe a dozen years because of his capacity to help the world sort these things out. It's an amazing story. Archie Butt would be worth another lecture. You know, that's another fascinating relationship because he got caught between Taft and TR and felt uh, deep sympathy and commitment to both of them. You know, splendid lecture. Now you're going to go off to the book signing. People will follow you if you just go down to your breakout room and go over there and then come back uh, if you have time. We'll continue to have a reception here for those who wish it. We so appreciate your insights, and we will look forward to your forthcoming biography of Elihu Root. <laughs> No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Yes. Right. So I believe, again, everyone should be able to move to the break room if they choose. I do have a copy of Dr. Oyos' book here. And I just want to say this, for those who are not particularly connected to the military and maybe even not very interested, you, this can be an area that's rather intimidating. And that's how I would describe myself. I love this book. It's extremely readable and very insightful, just as you've seen this evening. So I very much, very strongly encourage you to get this. It's fabulous. In Command, Theodore Roosevelt and the American Military.